Welcome to the Chief Architect Rendering Seminar. My name is Kayla, and today we're going to talk through some tips and tricks that can help you improve the quality of your rendering and go through some different rendering styles and see how we can improve on each. We'll talk about some lighting and material options, including placing a sun angle, and we'll talk about some export options and some ways to send that over to your client. So let's just jump right into the software. I'm going to jump into a plan that I already have open. So right now we're looking at our 2D plan view, but if we want to open a 3D view, we have them available under our 3D menu. We have orthographic views, which typically we would think of in terms of a cross section or an elevation, but we do also have 3D overviews. Um, the difference between our orthographic and our perspective view, but the orthographic is not going to have a vanishing point. So lines that look parallel are going to appear parallel in a 3D view versus our perspective view where we have a vanishing point and we're more as though we're standing in the plan. So I'll start just by opening a perspective full overview. So this is going to place us outside the home. And if we look back on our floor plan, you can see the camera view that it created. It's set away from the home and we have a focal point set in the middle of the plan. There's a large terrain on this plan, so it placed it in the center of where the terrain is. So that means that when I rotate around, I'm going to rotate around that focal point. When we're in a perspective view, whether it's a full overview or a full camera, we can zoom in and out using the scroll wheel. When we open up the camera view, we're automatically in our orbit camera, so we can click and drag to rotate around. The scroll wheel also will let us zoom in until we enter the home. So then it puts us in a place where we're standing inside the home. By zooming in, I actually modified that focal point. So I'm going to zoom out just a little bit, again using my scroll wheel. And if we look at our camera view, we now have a much longer focal line with the focal point here. And when we rotate around the camera, we're going to be rotating around that point. So if I move this camera in my 2D view over to the kitchen, and I put that focal point right on top of the sink, when I rotate around, I'm going to be rotating right around that sink. That's going to be the focal point of my camera. If I reduce that focal point so that it's right over top of the camera, now, when I rotate around, it's as though I'm just standing in place and moving around the plan. Some other easy ways to navigate in 3D, I can use the arrow keys on my keyboard, move left and right, forward and back. If I push down on the scroll wheel on my mouse, I can pan around so I can adjust the position of my camera view. And then if I am working with a tool in the software and I don't want to drop that tool, so for instance, if I'm trying to paint a color and I don't want to drop that tool in order to move into another room, the scroll wheel can be really handy for that as well because it allows me to zoom in to pan around without dropping that tool. And if I hold down the Alt key and push on my scroll wheel, I can then rotate around. So this allows me to get a really good angle, not only for producing a 3D image, but also for while I'm actually designing, because now I can paste that color anywhere in the plan that I want to and apply it. So one way that we can show off the home to our clients is to move around the live 3D model. So using the scroll wheel, using your arrow keys, however you need to do it, the easier that you can do that, the easier it will be to show off the home. But also, it can help us to find a good angle if we're going to be exporting a 3D image of the home. So, for instance, if I move around over here, oftentimes you'll get a, into a view where you have much too much ceiling. And so paying attention to the way that your camera is focused and the things that it is focusing on is very important when we're producing a 3D view. So that's how using some of that navigation can help us to just reduce the camera, move it around, make sure that we're getting a good shot of the scene, and then we're getting a good number of textures that'll just produce a higher quality image and a more inviting image for the client. 
Now, if you are working with a live 3D model with your client, there are some really handy ways when we're outside the home to be able to show off what's going on inside the home, especially in a large home like this where there's a lot going on. One of them is the cross-section slider. So this is similar to a cross-section that you might draw in 2D that's going to produce an elevation view, but instead we're going to do so in our 3D view here. This allows us to, for instance, cut off the front of the home and drag the slider forward until you get a nice cross-section of everything going on in the home. You also can type in manually a dimension, so if you want to increase by 10 inches, we can go 160 inches, for instance, and hit tab, and it'll just jump forward a little bit. Then we can do multiple cross-section sliders. So if I want to place another one on this edge, I can, and I can just slide that forward a little bit. And now I'm going to use my more precise numbers to type in, let's do 360, and hit tab. Now it looks like we need to go a little further. Let's go 370. That allows me to just get a nice clip of the home. So now if I exit out of there, I can rotate around, really see inside the home, see what's going on in multiple layers, similar to if you're working with a child's dollhouse. And anytime you want to turn that on or off, cross-section slider, we can just uncheck different options or recheck them back. Another really great option is in your camera settings themselves. So here in this drop down, we can edit the active view. So we can edit the camera that we're working with right now. And one of the options in here, and we'll talk about some of the other options a little bit later, but I'm just going to select hide camera facing exterior walls. So this means that when I rotate around, the exterior walls that are facing the camera are invisible. But when I see the interior portion of a wall, it's going to remain visible. So as I rotate around the home, all of those exterior walls become invisible, which makes it really easy for me to navigate around and really see what's going on inside. Having this option on also when you're working inside means that if you move your camera outside the home a little bit, it'll automatically turn those walls invisible. So your camera is not going to extend through that exterior wall and ruin the shot. It gives you a nice wider shot of the home. If you are going to be exporting an image of it, now we don't have the exterior wall in the way and we're getting a really good shot of what's going on across this entire space. So now I'm just going to zoom in on this kitchen again and let's talk about some of our rendering styles that we have. Right here we have our rendering styles. The standard view is probably the one that you're working in the most. Out of the box, when you create a camera view, it's going to open up your standard view, which means that you have all of your textures turned on. We have some photorealism. Some of these other options are going to reduce down to a pattern rather than a texture, which means that instead of seeing the picture of the texture itself, we're just going to see the underlying pattern or fill style for the material. Then we have a glass house. So this is a great style for us to be able to see what's going on in, in a kitchen inside of cabinets. So we can see we have a trash pull out here, what shelves we have going on in full height cabinets or in our base cabinets. It just gives a really good open view. Also, if you're looking into other rooms, sometimes it can get a, give us a really good feel for the overall space of a floor plan. So then we have our Photone and technical illustration, which are both going to break it down into fewer tones, although the technical illustration is going to really focus on the patterns. Then painting in watercolor and line drawing. And let's open up technique options so that we can talk about the rest of these. The technique options are going to allow us to go through each of these rendering techniques and just specify a little further how they're looking. But when we talk about a watercolor, when we swap over to it, it will change our view even when we're in this rendering technique options. We can specify things like how smooth is the watercolor, how strong are the edges of this, and we can place a line drawing on top. A lot of these are going to determine how much does it look like a render and how much does it look like a watercolor. And then the line drawing on top is a nice way for us to be able to define the edges a little bit better. So when we select OK, 
This is a pretty common architectural drawing technique to have the watercolor with the line drawing. And the line drawing, we have control as well on how squiggly the lines are. So how much does it look like it's hand drawn versus line places placed over top of the design. And then you have just a straight line drawing so without the watercolor. And same thing, you have some, some control over the squiggle of the lines and how defined those are. So finally, we have our physically based render. This is similar to the standard, but it adds in some additional photorealistic elements. So one of the most important things that it does is it increases the interaction of the light and the materials. So we're getting more reflections on metal surfaces, for instance. That's a very quick, easy thing for us to see immediately. And we'll take a look at some material properties here shortly to show how you can edit those specifically. Improve lighting quality. I'm not going to check quite yet. I'm going to go ahead and select OK. We'll come back into this in just a minute because let's talk about some lighting. So first of all, let's go back into the Edit Active view. So this is editing the camera that we have open. And I want to make sure that I have shadows, reflections, and edge smoothing turned on. Edge smoothing is just when, we're, when the camera is still, when we're not moving around, it just sharpens the edges a little bit to make it a little bit more enhanced and realistic. And here we have our lighting options. Right now we're set to use a maximum number of eight lights, which means there's a calculation behind the scenes, but roughly it's going to grab the eight lights closest to us in the room that we're in. You can increase this number. You probably don't want to go more than 20 or 30 at a time because the more lights that you have turned on, the slower the rendering can go. But you also can set up light sets. When we toggle over to this, I actually have a couple of light sets set up already. But if I didn't, I could go into Adjust Lights, create a new set, and basically decide what lights are going to be turned on in this camera view right now. In this case, I have one set for the first floor, so that all the lights in my first floor, which I have this big, great room for this first floor, all of them are going to be turned on all at once, but anything on any of the other floors will not be turned on. So then I'll select OK, and it'll apply the shadows and it'll adjust the lighting for the room as well. And it takes just a second for it to refresh. And with our shadow, you can see we have some sunlight coming in this direction. We can actually set a sun angle in the plan. So I'm going to go back to the floor plan just to talk about this first. A sun angle is one of our line options. So you can place a sun angle in your plan and it'll open it up just by clicking in the plan. It opens up this dialog. You can choose where the home is, what time and date you have. Um, I usually like to do kind of an early morning sun because that's going to cast our shadows longer. And then you can select to make a shadow in the plan. And in this case, I need to turn on this layer in my view. Then you can see specifically where that shadow is going to hit at that time that I just placed. And it would be important for me to have a north pointer as well, because if north is going the other direction, or if it's going somewhere like this, it's going to drastically affect where my shadows are hitting. So I'm going to move it around this direction. So in my full overview, you can see the shadows have changed. I have those big long shadows because we are seven o'clock in the morning and we have big old windows here. And everything's gonna refresh around the light change that I just made. Also, while in this 3D view, under this drop down for lights, we can adjust the sunlight. So I can edit the sun angle that I just placed, or I can swap over to use a generic sun. So generic sun is not using any time or date specifics. It does allow me to toggle around where that sun is. So move around the direction. I'll move it quite extensively here so you can see eventually it will come in this direction. And then also the tilt. So the tilt would be um, like along the horizon. How far is that sunlight going to travel? So a zero degree would be similar to noon, where it's just coming straight down. 
and then we can adjust the intensity. Right now, my backdrop is pretty intense back here, but dropping this down just a little bit allows that backdrop to enhance, and since all lighting in the program is relative to each other, it also will give just a little bit stronger of an effect to my interior lights so that they make more of an impact on the scene. If this were a real world scene, the sunlight really would overpower all of the lights inside of the house because the sun is just far more intense than interior lights. When we want to kind of fake out the program into paying more attention to the interior lights, dropping down the sunlight's intensity can just help with that. It gives us the ability to make sure that the interior lights have more of an effect on the plan as a whole. So if I drop it down to a 1000, you can see the interior lights change quite a bit to adjust around that. Now I'm going to go back into my technique options and let's talk about improve lighting quality. This one just increases the number of calculations that the program is making with light. Basically, every pixel of light is going to bounce off of every surface that it can find. The program is not going to calculate that to infinity, it's going to stop those calculations at some point. Improved lighting quality just increases the number of calculations that it's going to make. So it just gives it a, a more realistic effect with the lighting as a whole. And it's going to take a second for it to refresh, but it'll adjust our lighting quite a bit. And then the other options here are more like our photo editing options. So hue, saturation, uh, I don't usually mess with those too much. The saturation is going to hugely affect the oranges and greens in the plan. So sometimes if I have a very white plan that I want to move more towards the warm hue, adding saturation can help. Brightness is exactly what you think it is. This is already a pretty bright plan, but if I increase it, we're going to really start to lighten up. We're also going to wash out the white, so I'm not getting as much definition between the cabinets in the back and this countertop. So pulling down that brightness can help a little bit to define the difference between those two. Now let's talk about materials a little bit, because I've mentioned a couple of times that this particular render style is really important in how the lighting and the materials interact. We have metal materials over here that are defining how the light is hitting this material that's making it look like a metal. Let's focus a little bit on this flooring. I'm going to use my Adjust Material Definition tool, this little rainbow tool here, and I'm just going to click on the floor. So this is going to open up my Define Material, and I'm going to come down to, first of all, Pattern is what we were using for our vector view. Also, the technical illustration is going to take the pattern. Texture is the actual picture image itself and how large the scale of that is. So increasing the scale increases how often it's going to dial this material across the plan. And then, Blend with texture will allow me to change the color of the material as a whole. So if I wanted more like a gray, I could blend with the texture and make it a gray flooring. I'm going to uncheck that. A bump map, I'm not going to get too much into the maps behind an image. Bump map is one of the easiest ones to understand though, because what it does is it pushes back dark parts of an image and it pulls forward the light parts. I can set the image as a bump map of itself. So if I highlight and copy that and paste it into the bump map, and when I hit tab, you'll see an effect on the image. And the more that I increase that, the more you're going to see that effect take place. I'm gonna rotate around a little bit so you can see how that's taking place. The more I increase it, the more 3D it's going to look. Typically, you want to stay closer to 0.1 or less. I'll just pull out the grain a little bit, make it look a little bit more hand scraped. And to invert it is to flip which, whether the light or the dark are being pulled out in 3D. So essentially, all of the maps, we have a bump map, normal map, ambient inclusion, and then on properties, we have a roughness and metal map. They're all giving the program information on how the light is hitting that particular texture to give it a little bit more of a 3D view. 
the maps are, are faking your eye into thinking that there's a 3D object there, even though it's a 2D surface. If I select to invert, you can see it's going to change the way that that map is applied. And then properties is going to have a lot to do with the lighting. So this is set to be a matte material, meaning it's not going to have much of an, a reflection on it. Whereas if I chose something like polished, I'm going to get much more of a reflection as I move around as that hits the light. General material is going to give us more control over things like specular and roughness, which basically are going to affect how that light is hitting the object. So specular is going to make it more shiny. Roughness is going to decrease the shininess, kind of like a carpet is going to be an extremely rough material where you're not getting any reflection off of a carpet. And then transparency and emissivity. So emissivity is going to determine whether or not a material looks as though it's giving off light. This is different than adding a light source to, for instance, a light object. Um, it would be something like a TV screen where it just gives a sort of glow, but it's not necessarily within the program casting light onto the scene. So I'm going to swap back to a matte material and we'll just apply the change just to see the bump map. So for this material, it's just giving a little bit more texture. For something like a tile, it can allow the grout to look as though it's recessed into the tile. So the properties of a material are very important when we're talking about creating a good render, because as we're looking at the materials of this room, this particular black material I have set to have some specularity, which is why we're getting a bit of a glow that's coming off of that, because it's a little bit reflective. Same with this wood material. It's not set to be a matte, it's set to have a little bit of a reflection, so it has a bit of a sheen to it. We'll talk more about materials next week when we work with ray tracing, because ray tracing adds in a few additional material properties, including how it affects glass, so glass coming into this scene, or any scene that's utilizing a lot of glass, like a bathroom or over here with this railing, ray trace is going to affect that a lot more than physical base render, which is not going to touch it very much. Before we export this image and we talk about some of our export options, I wanna go through just a quick review of what we talked about. In creating a really good render image, being able to manipulate your camera and get into a good camera view is very important. And the settings of the camera itself. So. Under this dropdown, we have Edit Active View, which allows us to edit the camera, show shadows, affect how many lights are showing up in the scene. That's all manipulated from the camera. And then technique options, I would also call a camera setting because that's going to have some of our photo adjustment settings and to improve the lighting quality. We didn't talk much about exposure, but exposure has to do with how much sunlight is hitting this scene. So if we up the exposure, eventually we're going to wash out the scene. So you want to kind of have a balance of how much exposure you're having in the scene versus how much brightness you're using. So camera settings and lighting settings. So some of those lighting settings were in the camera itself, but also the sunlight is another very important way that we adjust the lighting. So we placed a north pointer, which allowed us to place a sun angle and make sure that we are placing the sun coming in at a very particular time. Then I came down in this lighting setting to adjust sunlight. I moved it over to a generic sun, but if we want to go back to our sun angle, which is using a much higher intensity of sun and a very particular time of day, we can see how that's going to adjust the image. When we adjust any of the lighting in the room, we may need to adjust the camera settings alongside it to make sure that we're not washing out the scene. And with physical base rendering, it does need to refresh any time that we make a scene, which is why you see things go black, and then it takes a little bit for everything to take effect again. So I'll go back to just our generic sun. And then finally, we talked about materials. So materials are gonna be the, the final 
element in making sure that the lighting is hitting all of our materials correctly and that the materials are the right color and the right texture for the scene. Once we have everything set, we'll go ahead and export this. Under File, we can go to Export, and there's a couple of different export options. One of them would just be to export this as a flat picture. So if we export it as a picture, we need to decide what size is that going to be. A typical high definition image is going to be 1920 by 1080. So I will go ahead and put 1080 into height, that's pixels. Then I'll hit tab and the width is going to be much larger than 1920. So I may need to crop this down on the sides if I want it to be exactly 1920 by 1080. Resolution, this is how many pixels per inch. Basically the higher the resolution, the typically the higher quality the image. I usually bump it up to 1 or 200. And then when you select OK, it's going to ask you where you want to save that. So you'll save that image in your computer somewhere, and then you can share that with your clients. You can have multiple different camera views. And when we're looking at the Edit Active View, one of the options is to save this camera so that then it is available in your plan. You can just double click to open it up. You can save multiple camera views, all with different rendering techniques and different angles of the home. And you can export all of those pictures and save them. Another export option that we have under File Export Again is to export it as a 360 panorama. Earlier when I reduced the focal point of the camera so that we could rotate around and look like we're just standing in place, that's similar to how the 360 panorama will be. It exports it as an image where you can then interact with the image, rotate around if you have a 360 viewer. Typically, you're going to want to save it to your cloud account. So if you have an account on our website, then you have a cloud account. You can name it. In this case, we want to be specific and name it the kitchen. If you have different rendering techniques or different angles, you may want to give a description. Also, if you have four different options for this kitchen, you may need to put option A. I'm not going to save it onto the computer itself. I'm just going to save it into my cloud account. Again, there are particular sizes you can export it as. This is a somewhat small size. You may want to increase that, but I'm going to leave it. Select OK, and you'll have to log in. And then it's going to export it and send it directly to your account on our website. So while it's exporting, I'm going to get my account open. In your account, you'll have the 360 panoramas, and you can just view that in which case we have a full 360. We didn't look at the back, so we would definitely want to make sure that we look at that so we can decrease the brightness and possibly the exposure before we export it. And then you can make this image public, and as soon as you make it public, you get a share button where you can send your client that link or you can email it directly from here or even embed it on your website you have an interactive 3D of homes that you've created on your website. So really focusing in on your 3D images, getting some good rendering options, it really helps you to be able to not only sell the job, but also to be able to fix any problems that might come up before you actually get into the design and start making changes. So the client's able to see what you have in mind and give you a good response before you actually start putting things in and then have to do some really costly changes after the fact. And the variety of rendering techniques that we have can really help with the different types of clients that you may have. So for instance, this image that we're looking at right now, which is that watercolor with the line drawing on top, it makes it really clear that this is a render and not an exact replica of what the home's going to look like. And some of the images, like the technical illustration and the vector view, are going to break it down even further. Some of those are going to eliminate color. So that the client's not quite so focused on the color of the design. It gets to focus a little bit more on the architectural elements. The photorealistic one might sell the job, but some of those other ones are going to help you to really hone in on what are we looking at in this design and is this design going to work for you, rather than needing to focus so much on some of the minor details that are just not as important. So I highly recommend utilizing more of the rendering techniques if you're only using one or two. 
and getting into the technique options allows you to edit those techniques. So for instance, the glass house that we were looking at, we can modify to be a different color. The technical illustration, you can have different warm and cool colors that you're using. It just really hones in the image so that it's how you want to be able to present it to the client because the default out of the box is just how we have it set up. But you may want to make some changes to that so that it's very specifically how you're going to design. So thank you so much for attending today's demonstration and please let us know if you have any questions.